Good morning and welcome back to another Teaching Sound Doctrine Bible class. As always, we want to thank you for being here. We want to ask you to grab a pencil and paper, open your Bibles with us, and let's study from God's Word. Today's lesson uh, it was put together by Michael, and he did an excellent job on this, and I turned it into a lesson. So what we're going to be looking at, and I don't think we can look at this too often, uh, the more we look at, at, at this topic that we're going to talk about today, the, the more important it becomes. And what we're going to look at is the worship of the Lord's church as God would have it. And this is going to be part one. And this is going to be a multi-part lesson. Some of the lessons will be shorter than others, but we're going to begin uh, by looking at, at part one here. So the importance of, of uh, worship uh, should be taken into consideration very often by the Christian because so many liberal things have worked their way into the church. And, you know, Hosea said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And so I want to refresh your memory on this one particular topic. And I can think of no better way to do it than breaking down this into lessons. So, by way of introduction, I want to uh, uh, go ahead and begin the class. Now, as you see, when, when God created man in Genesis 1, he placed within man certain needs. You know, we immediately recognize the, the need for things like air and water and food, etc. But there are other needs that are often overlooked. Love is one of them. Community would be another. Purpose or direction in life. Creativity, such as putting something back into the world, etc., etc., etc. So God created us as a needy being, and He's the one that fulfills those needs. Among those needs is the need to worship. You see, God created man with a worshiping nature. And as such, we observe man worshiping God from the very beginning. And we also notice that some worship was pleasing to God, but some worship was not respected by him. Cain and Abel offered sacrifices unto God, offering worship to him. And then God had uh, respect for Abel's offering, but not Cain's. Simply read Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. So as God reveals to the Israelites his law, he reveals how to proper, properly worship him. God also reveals that if they worship idols or graven images, their worship would be sin. And Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and with him only shalt thou serve. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. Therefore, we must learn what kind of worship and what worship pleases God so that we may be accepted and not rejected by God. Now, there are types of worship. The Jews of Jesus' day were transgressing God's uh, commands by substituting their traditions for the Word of God. Jesus informed, informed them, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9. By teaching man's will instead of God's uh, word, their worship was valueless, worthless, or fruitless. Here's, here's worship which had no value to, with God, none, of that, none at all. When Paul was in Athens, he saw the city completely given over to idolatry. They had built altars 
to every God they could imagine. Fearful they might have left one out and thus not appease him, they built one to an unknown God. Well, as Paul uh, sees this, he declares, for as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. And this comes from Acts chapter 17, verse 23. They were worshiping, but they were not worshiping the only true God. They needed to be instructed concerning him. And Paul undertook to do this. This ignorant worship was not and, uh, and is not acceptable to God. And we see that so much today. Ignorant worship of God. Just look at any denomination out there. They have substituted their own beliefs for the word of God. And they go along like nothing's wrong. And it's simply sin. Because they're not worshiping God in the way he wants to be worshipped. You see, Paul mentions another type of worship in his writing to the Colossian brethren. <coughs> Pardon me. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in all worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Colossians chapter 2, verse 23. This is worship which one chooses to do for himself. It is a worship which one advise, or devises and prescribes for himself. And we see that all over the place today. Worshiping in a way which pleases ourself and not God. This is just simply, it's not true worship. This worship is generally contrary to that revealed within the presence or uh, within the pages of God's revealed word and is thus not acceptable to him. While the preceding types of worship are rejected by God, Jesus discusses the type of worship which is pleasing and acceptable to him. The Samaritan woman perceived that Jesus was a prophet so she asked about the place of worship. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is, uh, is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now that comes from John chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. But what, what happens here? Well, Jesus establishes three great truths concerning acceptable worship today. He also indicates that there would be a change in our worship. Jesus knew that he was ushering in a new covenant and that we would no longer be under the old covenant. So what is true worship? Well, our worship to be valid in God's sight must meet these three requirements. Our worship must be directed to the Father. As God spoke to the Israelites, he began the Ten Commandments by saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make unto thee, uh, shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. 
thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, if you want to know where that's at, you simply look up Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. See, God was teaching them that he was the proper object of worship. Well, as Jesus was tempted by Satan, Satan tried to get him to fall down and worship me. Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. When then saith unto him, uh, then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Anytime anyone changes the object of our worship, he commits sin and makes that worship an abomination. Now, second, our worship must be in spirit. We must possess the proper attitude in our worship to God. Often, the prophets of old condemned the Israelites because they went through uh, the proper motions of worship, but did not have the heart involved. Their heart involved in it. They had all the externals of God's religion, but not the internal. So today, we must possess the proper internal attitude of the heart for our worship to be pleasing to God. It is my humble opinion that we have a great deal of difficulty in this respect today. We come to services to worship God, but allow mundane things to creep into our minds, choking out spiritual matters. And you can see that today by uh, parents allowing their children to their teenage children to sit there on their electronic devices and this and that and the other when they should be being taught at home and being taught to respect God's word and the proper type of worship in the church. And I'm not picking on teenagers, don't get me wrong, but I find it that the parents are at fault here for not teaching them this and making them uh, understand the importance of why they're going to church. So we thus sing songs without ever thinking about what we're saying. I see this a lot of times. People are just standing there mumbling the words and they're not they're they're not really paying attention to the song. Or they say, well I've heard it over and over and over. Well that's that's not the point. It it comes from within you. You should be uh, overjoyed at the fact that you can sing praises to God. We pray, often using the same expression without giving it any thought. How many times have you sat and listened to somebody in your congregation that prays the same prayer every time they're asked to lead prayer? You see, uh, their heart is not in it. Many never hear the sermon because they're talking, uh, taking a nap, passing notes, making faces at the baby, you know, uh, that's close by, etc. All kinds of things are, are taking your mind off of God's word. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, well, do we fail to remember the sacrifice that he made and allow our minds to wander from the memorial service? Are we more worried about what we're going to do after church and than the actual memorial service that we're partaking of in remembering the sacrifice that Christ made? You see, we, like the Jews of old, are going through all the externals of our religious service, but without the proper spirit. Now, third on this list is our worship must be in truth. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer recorded by John, prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth. 
Thy word is truth. John chapter 17, verse 17. Thus, when Jesus speaks of our worship being in truth, he has reference to it being according to the word of God, the Bible. God has authorized certain acts by which we can worship him today. Realizing, as mentioned previously, we are under the New Testament, those actions God commanded under the Old Testament are no longer authorized. Today, we must look to the New Testament for our authorization. Now, we went over this in our last couple of classes about the Old and the New Testament, how the Old Testament was done away with, that it is there for our learning, but it's not there for our practice. Well, you see, God is authorized for our worship today to sing, to pray, to contribute, to partake of the Lord's Supper, and the preaching. To deviate from that which God has prescribed, as did the Jews in Matthew chapter 15, makes our worship vain. So the remaining portion of these lessons are going to deal with that which God has authorized in our worship to him. We know uh, the acts of worship. But do we really take heart with them? Do we really do them wholeheartedly? Do we do them in spirit? And do we listen to the truth that the preacher is explaining from the Bible? You see, there's so much more to worship. It has to be, uh, now I'm not a touchy-feely guy, don't get me wrong. But you have to know why you're going to church. You have to understand the proper forms of worship. And that's what we're going to look at over the next several lessons. So I'm going to leave it here with you. I want you to go back over this study. These are always made available uh, right above the uh, video on our website, jfmiller.com forward slash online class. You can, you can find the videos and the transcripts. And if you just want to listen, all of these lessons are there in MP3 format. You can download them and listen to them at any time. So I appreciate you being here and I appreciate the attention you pay. And until next week, may God bless.